Genesis chapter 25, beginning in verse 19. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, and so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. And so he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. It's the word of the Lord. In, in our family, uh, Whitney does the bulk, my wife Whitney, she does the, the bulk of the grocery shopping uh, because she, she likes to do that. She, she likes to have a plan and go and, and, and to, to get all the things that, that our family needs, uh, which is great. Uh, but sometimes she will send me uh, to, uh, to the grocery store, uh, but always with a, a detailed list of the items that, that I need uh, to get. Now, now, earlier on in our marriage, uh, she would send me to the, uh, the store with this list, and then I would come back home uh, with the grocery bags, and, and there would be a number of items missing. And then also a few items included that weren't on the list that, that I decided to purchase. And, and so Whitney would ask, she would say, uh, why, why didn't you get the coffee creamer that was on the list or the, the tomatoes that, that we need? And, and I would say, well, I was in the store and I was looking and I, and I said, the, the prices on those items were a little bit too expensive or, or some things, I didn't think I would like them and so I picked something else or, or maybe they were out of stock or, or something like that. So, so either I would get a, a substitute or simply not bring anything home uh, at all. And so I thought, no big deal, right? It's just a list. I can pick and choose uh, what I want. Wrong, wrong. It's, it's actually a very big deal to make sure that you get all of the things on uh, the list. Because as I soon learned, when my wife would send me to the grocery store with a list of items to buy, that that list of items was not just a, a random assortment of things just to stock our home but that those items were reflected in a plan, something they called a, a meal plan. Some of you may be familiar with this, where Whitney actually, what she does is she plans what meals she might want to cook over the coming week or weeks, and then needs to buy those items. And so when I would come home without tomatoes, she would say, how are we supposed to have spaghetti and meatballs without tomatoes or meatballs, right? So how, how are we supposed to do that? And, and so for me, the, the problem was that I was making what I thought were wise, careful decisions from my perspective, but I did not recognize the bigger plan that these individual items were attached to. In our passage this morning, it is the infamous story of someone who made the wrong choice. 
And in, in fact, some say that, that our lives are simply the sum of all of the choices that we make. And, and so I wonder, as you think about making choices in your life, what do you do to make sure that you make the right choices and don't make the wrong choices? Maybe you're like the, the, the famous uh, Japanese organizing consultant, Marie Kondo, and, and she says you need to consider what sparks joy in your life. Or, or maybe you, you need to process, and so you call all of your friends and your, and your family, your parents, and, and try to process with them. Or, or perhaps you like to make a pro-con list or, or do a SWOT analysis or get out an Excel spreadsheet and kind of work out the, the way to make your decision. But what our passage says this morning is actually there is a best way to make decisions. All of these things are great. They can be helpful. But, but that the best way to make wise choices in our lives is that we consider each choice that we make in light of and in love of the bigger story that we're a part of that we need to always be mindful in the midst of our individual choices of the meal plan, the, the bigger plan, the plan of God's redemption for humanity. And God's plan of redemption, that's what the book of Genesis is really all about. This morning, we're beginning a new sermon series in the book of Genesis, chapters 25 to 35. And really, this is the, the continuation of a sermon series that I began in Genesis chapter 1 about uh, five, six, seven years ago or so. We, we did chapters 1 through 11, and then we did 12 to the beginning of 25, and now we're, we're picking back up again, continuing through the book of Genesis. The, the title, Genesis, simply comes from the first sentence of the Bible, in the beginning. Genesis means beginning, the start most evangelical scholars would say that Moses was the author of Genesis. Either he compiled records that had been handed down to him, or that he received direct revelation from God, that he was able to write and compile the book of Genesis. The first audience for this book would have been the Israelites while they were wandering in the wilderness. So actually, the, where we just came out of the, the Ten Commandments, it was during that time when Moses was writing and reading and sharing the message of Genesis with the Israelites. But of course, the book of Genesis is not only the word of Moses. It is also the word of God speaking through Moses. And it's not just for the ancient Israelites who are wandering the, uh, in, in the wilderness thousands of years ago, but it's for us today. Genesis reveals to us the, the roots of our faith and, and more particularly how God preserves his salvation plan through a family despite the sin and the brokenness of the world and even within this family as we will see. So as we dive into our text this morning about, about making the right choices, we'll see a few different people making choices in this passage but the first person who makes a choice is actually the most important. First, we will see God make a choice. And that's in verses 19 through 26. And then we'll talk about our own choices as we look at the, the story between Jacob and Esau. So first, let's look in verses 19 to 26 at God's gracious choice. If you look with me at verse 19, verse 19 begins this, this way. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. This is the account, or, or literally, these are the generations of Isaac. In, in fact, maybe you, you, you've been reading the Bible, but you didn't realize this, that the, the book of Genesis is organized into ten generations. The, you have the beginning with the generations of the heaven and earth in Genesis chapter 2, and then the generations of Adam in Genesis chapter 5, and it goes on, the, the generations of Noah, and then you did Terah, that's Abraham's father, and then the generations of Isaac, and the generations of Jacob. And there's many more mixed in there as well. Ten generations that are sort of the, the structure and the framework for the book of Genesis. It, it is a, a family tree. That word generations can also be translated as genealogies. It is the account of a family. 
And this structure, this family, family structure, actually reveals the emphasis of the whole book of Genesis. We see that Genesis 1 and 2 teaches us how God created all things good, including man and woman in his own image. But then, of course, Genesis chapter 3, that Adam and Eve, they, they follow the temptation of Satan, the serpent, and they rebel against God and they fall into sin. But in the midst of God's judgment in Genesis chapter 3, he gives them hope. He gives them a promise. He says this, I will put enmity or hostility or hatred between you, serpent, you, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God, even in the midst of judgment from sin, will someday provide an offspring, a descendant, who will finally crush the head of the serpent and heal the world of its sin and brokenness. And so then all the rest of the book of Genesis, and you could argue all the rest of the Bible, is focused on this family tree in which line this special, saving, gracious promise of God will be passed down through. And the language that Genesis uses for this is the language of blessing. Blessing, the, the smile of God, the gracious favor of the Lord. You know, when God first creates Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, the first thing he does is he blesses them. However, of course, because of sin, things get much worse before they get better, right? Their son Cain murders his brother Abel, and all the world grows more and more violent, and it becomes so awful that the Lord doesn't know what to do except to wipe out all the people on the earth in the flood and start over. But mankind continues to still rebel against God over and over again. And you get to what is, I would argue, the lowest part in the, in the storyline of the scriptures in Genesis chapter 11. The depths of sin where all of humanity gets together in the Tower of Babel in rebellion against their creator. And yet God's blessing endures he grants Adam and Eve a third son named Seth, where the promise will continue. And later he blesses Noah when Noah comes safely out of the ark with his family to repopulate the world. And then, of course, God makes a special covenant where, where the scriptures in Genesis begin to, to shift from the, the devastation of sin into beginning to see God's redemption at work. In Genesis chapter 12, God makes a covenant, a special promise to Abraham. And God blesses Abraham, and he promises to make him and his family a blessing to all the nations of the earth. The promise back from Genesis chapter 3, the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, will continue through Abraham and his descendants. And even though the story says that, that, that Abraham and his wife Sarah are barren, God miraculously opens up her womb, even in very old age, 90 years old, and, and the blessing, the promise of redemption, the snake crusher is now passed down to Isaac. And now here we come to the generations of Isaac. But it's interesting, even though it introduces in the beginning the generations of Isaac, because this, this offspring, this family line is so important, it jumps immediately ahead to the next child, to, to Jacob. So it's going to backtrack next week, Lord willing. We'll look at that with, with Isaac and, and Abimelech and some things that Isaac does. But, but first, it needs to say, okay, here's the next child named Jacob. And interestingly, there, there we see some parallels here between Abraham and Isaac, right? Uh, we, we notice there, uh, I'm trying to see what verse, in verse 21, in verse 1, look with me there that Isaac, he prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And in fact, we, if you look at the, the years here, it was 20 years between Isaac and Rebekah's marriage and when they, they had the twins were born, before they became pregnant. Very similar to, to Abraham and Sarah, who were also childless and also had to rely on the Lord. But then God finally, verse 22, at the end of verse 21, the Lord answers Isaac's prayer and his uh, wife, Rebecca, becomes pregnant. Imagine how difficult those years would be for Isaac and Rebecca. 
Right? Not only as, as, as a couple, as a mom, and feeling the, the, the difficulty of wanting to have a child, particularly in that ancient culture where your children were your, your livelihood, your protection, your retirement plan, your economics of the, of the home, all of those sorts of things you needed children for. And she was childless. But, but then on top of that, they're supposed to be the family of promise. They're supposed to be the one through whom eventually the, the Savior will come of the world. And yet they can't even get pregnant. But finally, God does answer Isaac's prayer. But it's not really the, the joyful experience that Rebecca would have hoped. Look at me at, at verse 22. It says, the babies jostled each other within her. And this wasn't like normal kicks. You know, uh, my wife Whitney, she's pregnant in the second trimester, and she's, she's feeling the kicks. And sometimes if I put my hand on her belly, I can feel a couple uh, kicks from, uh, from our, our baby boy uh, to come. But this wasn't normal kicks. In fact, this word here, jostled, uh, it could better be translated that, that, these, that they were smashing into each other. The, these two brothers in the womb were at war. It was like an MMA boxing match in the womb. And, and you can imagine, Rebecca, if, if you, you don't know, you can ask some of our medical people, but, but usually babies in the womb, when mom is up walking around during the day because of the movement, the baby's asleep. But at night, when she lays down, the baby's awake, right? So you can imagine Rebecca laying in bed and just poof, 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 coming from inside her belly. And, and you talk to someone who's been pregnant, it, it can be painful. Like even a regular kick is like, oh, okay, come on, you know? Imagine twins, MMA, inside your belly. It was intense. And so Re Rebecca is, is just at her wit's end. And she says, what is happening to me? Verse 22. And so she goes, good for her, she goes and she asks the Lord, Lord, what is going on? And this is what the Lord says. He says, I have a plan. I have made a choice. Verse 23, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So before the boys are even born, the Lord has determined their days. Jacob, the younger son, will be the child of the promise. And he will receive God's blessing. He will lead their family. And from both of these boys will come two separated, distinct nations. Jacob eventually will be renamed Israel. And his sons will be the, the founders of the, the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And Esau's descendants become the nation of Israel. Edom. E Edom is in reference to the color red, which is why when you saw that mention with the red stew, why he's called Edom. Well, Edom becomes a nation, a people group, and the Israelites and the Edomites were enemies. They grew up to be, to be enemies of each other, and they would fight many battles, many wars, and usually the, the Israelites would win, would beat the, the Edomites, which was a fulfillment of verse 23. Now, 2,000 years later, the Apostle Paul is reading his Old Testament, reading his Bible, as he is writing the book of Romans, writing a letter to the church in Rome. And in chapter 9, he cites this account of Jacob and Esau as he's reflecting on the biblical doctrine of election. That God sovereignly chooses who he will save, not by our works, but by his free choice by his gracious initiative. Paul writes, When Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. And as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What Paul is writing there is he's saying that God is working out his purpose of salvation, and he is not limited in any way from accomplishing his redemptive plan. Now, perhaps when you hear that, and you maybe read other passages that talk about the sovereignty of God over salvation, and you might say, well, I, I wrestle with that. This idea of predestination, which is a biblical word. Or the idea of election, another biblical word. This seems to radically contradict my, my understanding of, of freedom and fairness. And actually, this afternoon, if you want to look and, and read Romans chapter 9, 
Paul actually addresses some of those questions. Is God unjust? Is he unfair? But as we talked about last week, when we finished up the Ten Commandments, talked about freedom, our cultural definition of complete sort of autonomous self-determination outside of any significant influence or restriction from anyone or everyone else, that definition of freedom is a fantasy. It's a fantasy. Nobody is truly completely independent, completely autonomous, completely without influence and significant influence on our thinking and our perspectives and our choices. And even if we could be completely autonomous and free, I'm not sure it would be a very good thing. And in fact, Taylor Swift isn't sure either. T Taylor Swift was giving a commencement speech back in 2022, uh, uh, last year, um, at NYU. And she said this in her commencement speech. She said, I know it can be really overwhelming figuring out who to be and when. Who you are now, how to act in order to get where you want to go, all the choices we have to make. I have some good news, she says. It's totally up to you. I also have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you. Taylor Swift is wise enough to know how intimidating it is to leave everything on your own shoulders. Your identity, your choices, your future, your everything. It is terrifying when you think about it. it. And it's especially terrifying in light, biblically, of Genesis chapter 3, in light of the reality of sin, that, that our hearts are unable to turn to God without his miraculous work. God's word says we are slaves to sin. We are in bondage to sin. We need his grace. We need his initiative. Or as Jesus says in John chapter 3, we need his new birth by the Holy Spirit, who's like the wind and blows where he will, bringing new life to us. If it's only up to us, it's not comforting. It's terrifying. But what if it's not only up to us? What, what if there is a God, Job 42 says, a God whose purpose can never be thwarted? And this God, we know, is bringing redemption into the world. He's bringing liberation and healing from sin and death, forgiveness and, and reconciliation back to himself. This should be incredibly comforting. Now, now as Yao read for us earlier in the service in the assurance of grace, we can't always see why. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And in, 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 with me and my kids, there are some times where I just have to tell them, uh, just trust me on this. Just tr as a parent, just trust me on this. Well, I don't understand. Just trust me. Or, or I'll tell you when you're older, right? If, if I have to do that sometimes with, with my kids, how much more do you think God has to do that with us? Right? Sometimes we think of God as just sort of a grown-up version of ourselves. Like eventually, you know, we're going to figure everything else out just like God does. But, but what is the passage that the Yah read, or call to worship passage? God is completely other. Nobody gives him counsel. He is, he is a source of all goodness and grace and also all power. His purposes are his own. And so there will be times when we'll have to say, God, I don't understand, but we can trust him. One author says this, he says, our greatest error in considering the choices of God is to think that God is just choosing for arbitrary reasons, as if his choices were random and senseless. God chooses according to his divine wisdom and love and goodness. We may not be able to understand all of God's reasons for choosing, and they are reasons he alone knows and answers to, but God's choices are not random or capricious. But we we can get a little sense of what God is doing here with his decision. We can discern some of his purposes, right? Ephesians 1 says that, that he predestines and adopts and redeems in love to the praise of his grace and glory. And it is in, in praising and loving our creator where we can find life and joy and satisfaction. And then even here in our passage this morning, we can see the Lord pointing us to the satisfaction that only he can offer. Can offer. 
he picks another barren couple. Not, the, not, not a couple who in their own strength, in their own wisdom, in their own wealth, in their own power can be seemed worthy, but no, a couple that literally is completely dependent upon a miracle from God to open up Rebecca's womb. And then he picks, he, she, she births not just one nation, but, but two nations. And, and what does God do? He actually upends the traditional social status of the day. You would say, okay, well, Esau is the firstborn. So, of course, Esau is going to have all the rights and privileges. And what does God say? That's not how I do things. Nothing in God's economy is earned. It is all by grace. And so God delights to use the, 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 the younger to lead the older. God, God delights to point us to himself, not human strength or birthright or power, but by human weakness. This is why the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For consider your calling, brothers, that many of you were, not many of you, were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong so that no human being would boast in the presence of God. And church, that, this is a theme all throughout the scriptures. This is why later on, when God chose the king of Israel, and Samuel shows up to the family's house, and you have all the, the, the oldest brothers who are strong and big and look like kings, and God says, no, I want the youngest, the scrawniest one, David. He's going to be the one to lead my people. And, the, and then, of course, Jesus himself, when he comes, not in a palace, but, but in a manger. He comes on as a powerful, wealthy, good-looking king of all kings, but he comes as a humble, plain despised, suffering servant. Jesus could walk into this room right now and we wouldn't recognize him. That's how plain he was. Friends, the sovereignty of God, the doctrine of election, it might perplex us sometimes. It, it, but it should more than perplex us, it should comfort us. Because it's a reminder that the world is not up to us that we are not the autonomous, self-determining creatures where everything is up to us, that we can rely on a bigger plan. In the midst of the chaos of our world around us, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the, the difficulties in our own life, we can have comfort knowing that there is someone with a higher pay grade, with higher power, and he is good, and he loves us. Charles Spurgeon famously said this. He said, the, do the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which the child of God rests his head at night, giving perfect peace. And in the same way God answered Isaac's prayer, God delights to answer our prayers. So that's God's plan. That's his choice, the, the, the meal plan, so to speak. God's plan of redemption, what he is doing, and we get to be part of that and so then if we want to make the right choices ourselves, we need to act in light of his plan when we consider our own still meaningful choices. So let's look at number two, our meaningful choices in verses 27 to 34. Now here, we see the fulfillment of God's plan in the way that God has created and wired Jacob and Esau. And yet, the fulfillment of God's plan comes through both of these men, their free choices. The, the, the things that they choose and, and what they do, that's meaningful. The boys are opposites to an extreme, right? Esau, his name sounds like Harry. That's why they named him Esau. And he came out of the womb, Harry. And then Jacob, whose name means heel grabber, because he came out of the womb grabbing Esau's heel. Verse 27 it says that Esau loved to be outside. He was your avid outdoorsman. And with Jacob, he was, he was an avid indoorsman. Jacob is a man after my own heart. I love to be inside, right? There's no bugs. I'm not wanting to, to you know, chop down trees or hunt or other things. I will leave that to other people to do. I, I like my air conditioning. I like my, or my heat, you know, inside in the safety of my own home. But they're different. These, these, kid, these guys are totally opposite from one another. And it's not just in the boys. It's also in their parents. Very sadly, they favor 
the opposites. So Isaac favors uh, Esau because he likes the food that he brings home, right, from his hunting. And Rebecca, we don't know why, it just says that she favors Jacob. It could be because of the promise that came from God. I, we're not sure. But sadly, the parents, they're exacerbating even this division that's going on. Well, and then we come to the story about the birthright. Now, in ancient culture, the birthright was a, a, a package of legal privileges. And so this would belong to Esau as the firstborn. Esau would get a double portion of the estate when uh, his father Isaac died. And, and the birthright also meant that the eldest son would be sort of the, the leader of the family. And in this family's case, the family of the promise, he would be the one to pass down the blessing. It would be his line would come the promise of redemption. But in that time, a birthright could be lost or even traded. And that would happen on occasion. And so verse 29 tells us that Esau was out hunting. He comes home. He is famished. He is feeling weak and, 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 and so tired and incredibly hungry. And Jacob is cooking. And so Esau sadly begins to, uh, agrees to trade his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. stew. Just a, a shameful exchange. Esau was controlled by his immediate needs. Very similar to Eve in the Garden of Eden. She looks and sees the fruit pleasing to the eye. It must taste good. Makes an impulsive decision. But verse 32 reveals the real reason of what was going on. Look at me, verse 32. Esau says, look, I am about to die. What good is the birthright to me? And then verse 34, he takes the lentil stew, he eats and drinks, gets up and left, leaves. It's like he didn't care. Esau was so concerned with his immediate need that he didn't think about his role in God's plan. Surely, you imagine, his parents must have told him about the promise. Surely they must have worshipped the Lord together as a family. And yet Esau was so focused on his own little grocery list that he did not see the larger story. He did not believe the word of God. He did not love God. And in fact, Esau is used as a later example in the book of Hebrews of unholiness. The author of Hebrews writes, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. One pastor says this, he says that history shows that men prefer illusions to realities. They choose time rather than eternity, and the pleasures of sin for a season rather than the joys of God forever. Men will read trash rather than the word of God and adhere to a system of priorities that leaves God out of their lives. Multitudes of men spend more time shaving than on their souls, he says. And multitudes of women give more minutes to their makeup than to the life of the eternal spirit. Men still sell their birthright for a mess of pottage, so this scholar says. Friends, if we want to make good choices that we won't regret, if we don't want to despise our birthright and, 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 and regret the decisions we make, we need to be mindful, not only of our own plans, our own agenda, our own immediate needs, but to zoom out and remember before our choice, God's choice, before our plan, God's plan. Because friends, when we're not thinking first of God's story, then we'll pray last and not first. You know, recently one of our, our TV remotes got lost. It's somewhere in the couch, somewhere buried. We don't know where it is. And, uh, you know, we, we, it's been a, a couple weeks now. And it says, I don't know where it is, you know. And so we, I remember we're pulling out all the cushions and looking. And I finally, we, we still couldn't find it. And I said, well, maybe we should just pray about it, you know. And I was convicting myself saying, well, why was that the last thing that I offered as an example for my family, my kids? Why was that the last thing? Why didn't we say, let's pray first, Friends, when we're not thinking of God's story, we pray last, not first. When, when we're not thinking of God's story, we compartmentalize our lives. 
We, we go through an entire work day making dozens and dozens of decisions without inviting God into them. When we're not thinking of God's story, when interruption or difficulty comes, we respond with anxiety or frustration instead of open-handedness to the one who's really in control of all things and knows what is best. When we're not thinking of God's story, when things don't go our way, we'll be tempted to lash out at others or lie or gossip or fall into despair. But friends, if Esau could only have had eyes to see and to love the glorious story that he was to be a part of. Church, if we only had the eyes to see and to love Jesus and the amazing spiritual blessing and birthright that we have in him through the Holy Spirit, if we reflect on that and remind ourselves of that and meditate on that and invite God into our individual choices, then we can make wise choices in light of his great choice of us. And friends, the choices we make, they matter. You know, I know this, this, this doctrine of election is hard to parse, and, but we just know it, it's not our job to, to, to just go around trying to figure out who God might have chosen or not. You notice here, right after this passage about God's sovereignty and his choosing, there are two men with free choices held responsible for their free actions. And so friends, our job is to strive to love and obey and serve the living God. And, and even 2 Peter says this. He, in 2 Peter, uh, uh, the Apostle Peter, he makes a, a list of, of different uh, attributes that we should strive for in our Christian life. He talks about faith and virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and godliness, brotherly affection, and ultimately love, right? He has all these different attributes in 2 Peter chapter 1. Ultimately, he said you should make good choices in your life to have these, these virtues. But then he says in verse 10, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so friends, we are not saved by our works. Our works, our actions, our character is not the root of our salvation. God delights to save wicked people and people who are lost like us. But our good works serve not as the root, but as the fruit of our salvation. And they can be used, as we see, as we continue to try to make choices in light of God's plan as confirmation that God, I don't know why you would have chosen me. Why, didn't, why, why did you choose me? I, I, I think about my own story, how I grew up in the church and just wandered away from the Lord, had heard the gospel so many times growing up and, and just rejected it as I got older. So said, this isn't for me. And yet, and yet God saved me in college, brought me back. I say, Lord, why, why did you choose me? I, I don't know. I don't know why. We don't, we can't know. But I know that I can try to just be thankful and pursue the Lord to confirm my calling and election. Now, if you see the way that this passage ends, it ends, Esau despised his birthright. This text is really focused on Esau. We'll get to Jacob, you know, in, in, in the next few passages, but, but Jacob doesn't come out of this passage looking super great either. He, he lives up to his own name, the, the heel grabber, the ambitious one, the one wanting power and influence, scheming and grasping. And, and notice he's scheming and grasping and manipulating for something that God has already promised him, right? And yet God is going to take that very characteristic in Jacob, his tenacity and his ambition, and he's going to whittle it down. He's going to craft it and turn it and use it eventually for his own purposes. And so that finally Jacob will not be a man who strives for himself, for his own plan, but he will be a man who strives with God. And in fact, he will be renamed Israel, which means one who contends or strives with God. Instead of grasping at the heels of power of his brother, he will be grasping at the heels of God to follow and honor him. But this plan at this point in Jacob's life is a reminder that both of these men are sinners. 
There's a story about the great pastor Charles Spurgeon where a woman came up to him and said, I, I can't understand why God would say that he hated Esau, that he would choose one over the other before they were born. And Spurgeon replied to this woman that that is not my difficulty. He said, my trouble is to understand not how God could have hated Esau, but how God could have loved Jacob. Because God didn't choose Jacob because he was good. Jacob became good because of God's gracious work in his life. And friends, so it is with us. Without Christ, we are sinners deserving and destined for destruction. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are living under the just wrath of God for our disobedience. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ultimately, God's choice, God's redemption plan, is so that his grace would be glorified, not our works. No one is worthy of salvation in the economy of God. No one is deserving of it. We are deserving of judgment. And yet the gospel is glorious. Not, not the shameful exchange like the stew and the birthright in this passage, but, but the glorious exchange that God's son would take on sinful humanity and take on all of the punishment that we deserve for all of our wrong choices. And then we would receive his blessing, the, the blessing, the smile, the favor of God and the birthright of his Holy Spirit within us. But we didn't deserve it. And so church, this passage is a warning and an invitation in the midst of the thousands of decisions that we will make, even some of us just this week, that we would make all of our right choices in light of his choice, that we would submit our plans to his plan, or as Jesus said, that we would seek first the kingdom of God and his glorious story of redemption. Let's pray. Well, Father, would you help us to see the comfort of your sovereignty and the fear and the folly of thinking of ourselves as, the, as, as autonomous creatures. And help us also to see that our choices matter. Would you open our eyes to your plan, to your work, so that we can be a part of it. Submit our lives to you, to your kingdom, to your story of redemption. I pray that you would draw any here or to yourself who does not know you. Father, I pray that you'd help us to grow in our character and our following after you, Jesus, in Christ's likeness so that we would confirm our calling and our election. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.